Good morning, everyone. How's everyone today? Awesome. Glad to hear it. So we were a mess at 9 o'clock. The PowerPoint didn't work. The recording didn't work. And it was a mess. I forgot to plug the thing back in, so I walked over. I was going to record just the uh, me presenting. Walked over. I forgot to plug it in, so it had died. Just a mess. But in my restarting it, everything works now. So we're going to record this one. You've got PowerPoint. I've plugged the computer into the wall. So this is going to be the one that goes live, and that's a good thing. So if you <laughs> once a week. <laughs> once a week. <laughs> If you're tuning in or, or watching the uh, recorded copy of the Bible class, you can find the handout at gracedowntown.org slash docs. If you're here in person, um, you grabbed a handout hopefully on your way in. We're continuing our series on the book of Zechariah, um, Picture the Passion, looking at the, the visions of the king that um, God had inspired his prophet Zechariah to uh, portray for us and to uh, record for us in his book. If you could flip your Bibles open to the book of Zechariah, that's where we will uh, predictably be beginning. Um, but we're going to start with just a review. This is an open book, open Bible review, so feel free to page back. What was the refrain, what was the message in the first six verses that God gave to Zechariah to uh, proclaim? He says to them, return to me, right? Remembering the historical context, um, Zechariah born in Babylon, one of the returnees that, that comes uh, back to uh, the, the land, of, of the promised land, and, and God has returned the people to their land and is going to see to it in their uh, future generations that they can rebuild the wall, rebuild the temple, rebuild their own homes. So God has returned the people to Jerusalem, now God is bidding Jerusalem to return to him. God has done the physical part of, of bringing them back, and now he's, he's uh, encouraging them and pleading with them, return to me your hearts. Okay? Then we get to... I keep forgetting I have this now. <laughs> um, then we get to the Night of Visions, February 15th, 519 B.C., give or take a day or two with calendar conversions, but we're given the um, specific night. He gets these eight visions, um, and the first one was of what? If you look at the NIV headings, you probably have a real good start um, as far as what these visions were about. Vision number one. A man in the myrtles, in the myrtle trees. Uh, the angel of the Lord appears uh, appears to Zechariah and, and delivers his message through that. The vision number two was the four horns and the four craftsmen. So we talked about horn being a symbol of power. And, and these are the four nations that, um, or nations in general, or maybe specifically the four nations that had displaced um, Israel, Jerusalem. And then the four craftsmen come to undo the power of the horns. Maybe this is just... Um, in general, again, nations that have God's blessing and direction as he plays the chess game of geopolitics to um, arrange things the way that he wants them to be. Or, or possibly this is um, for additional nations uh, we talked about um, last time. That So the middle three nations could be both a horn and a craftsman, both one that, that used their power against God's people and then one that had an, another nation influence them. Um, whether you go to specifics there in nations like, uh, like the prophet Daniel and some of his visions or just leave this more general as this is power and, and then God's influence, um, I'll be happy with you either way. And then the last one, the man with the measuring line, this was the divine remodel. Um, 
they were measuring out where they were going to put the shades and um, china cabinets in the new jerusalem um, the angel comes and measures out and says this is something i can work with that was the hgtv um, vision that that we had there this this measuring line as the symbol of future prosperity as a symbol of hope because of god's presence and influence now in this new place literally coming true for them in the rebuilding of Jerusalem, but far more importantly, especially to us, far more importantly, this, the heavenly spiritual Jerusalem um, that has been promised to us through faith in Christ. Okay? So we, we got three visions in. We're going to look at vision four and vision five. Um, today I'm going to try really hard to not spend 55 minutes on vision one and four minutes on vision two, like uh, might have happened an hour ago. But um, th this is just a great section of scripture, Zechariah chapter 3. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this, prepare for a treat, um, a, a really cool vision that God gives to Zechariah and uh, one that has some pretty awesome significance and meaning for us as well. So we'll start with chapter 3. You can follow along in your Bibles, um, whether you're here or at home, and I'll read chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes, and he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of all my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. The, there are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. All right, that's vision number, th number four from Zechariah chapter three. All right, first um, order of business is recognizing that Joshua actually was the sitting high priest at the time. So he was the descendant of Aaron, the one that was chosen for um, this special role, this special service. Um, this wasn't a vision of Aaron. This wasn't a vision of some unnamed, nebulous guy in a high priest costume. This was actually the man who was actually serving in this actual role at the time. So Zechariah gets this this vision of the one who is the current high priest, which I think is significant that this puts this vision in history, this, puts, this makes it real for Zechariah, that, that he recognized who the guy was. This is Joshua, the high priest. Okay? Um, there's a couple passages. I've got them up here, or you can look them up. Haggai 1, verse 1, which also reference Joshua, the high priest. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest. So this is the Joshua of, Zeph of uh, Zechariah chapter 3. He actually was serving in that function as high priest. Okay? A uh, similar thing in Ezra 5. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and in Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josadak, 
set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So here again, this is a real guy. This is the real function. He was a real man of standing and, and would have been significant, of course, to Zechariah, who was a prophet of the Lord. He would have recognized and known by name the high priest. Um, but this was, this was something that had some meaning. This was a message for these people of this time. Um, all right, and then here's one more, Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, this is a fast forward, a spoiler alert uh, for something that's coming. Uh, but take silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josedek. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is a man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. Um, the, the, the B and branch there is capitalized. We're going to get to talk about that. That word shows up also in Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, but here's something that's significant as we see that Joshua has some significance, not just in this place, but is also a type of someone coming forward, someone named the branch. Um, interesting and noteworthy that here in a few chapters, this crown gets placed on uh, Joshua's head. So the priest becomes a king in Zechariah chapter 6 to foreshadow one who would be both a priest and a king named the branch. I think you see where this is going. Um, this is showing that this high priest, Joshua, is a type of Christ. And uh, this is symbolic of the roles as both prophet, priest, and king that, are, that our Savior functioned in. Okay? So, review the function of the high priest. And then an additional question, is he serving in that function in Zechariah chapter 3. So what do you know about the high priest? Who is he? What does he do? Okay, he's the intercessor. He's the mediator. He goes between God's people and God himself. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Yes, he is the one who is the master of ceremonies on that special day called the Great Day of Atonement. He's the one who, who uh, takes the two goats out in front of the people. They choose um, one of the goats, and uh, the high priest puts his hands on that goat to signify the sins of the people. So here he is mediating again, right? Standing between God um, and the people. He puts his hands on that goat to signify that sins are being transferred to the goat, and then that goat is chased off into the wilderness. Um, never to be seen again. That's called the scapegoat. And we still use that terminology, that phrase, in different contexts today, right? If someone takes the fall when it was really someone else's fault, they're a scapegoat, right? Um, that's a biblical picture. And then the high priest also takes the other goat, and that goat is slaughtered, and it's only with a bowl of the blood of that goat that was slaughtered that he is allowed and able to enter the most holy place of the temple. Um, and he goes into that most holy place with that blood of this goat that's been sacrificed, ready to sprinkle it on the mercy seat of, uh, of God, ready to sprinkle it on then the people to signify um, that the forgiveness of sins has come through a sacrifice. So yes, the high priest is the master of ceremonies on that special day, um, and also the one who serves day to day as a uh, go-between um, ambassador, uh, mediator. So how about the question, is he serving in that function in Zechariah chapter 3? Is the high priest serving as the intercessor mediati mediator go-between here in Zechariah chapter 3? Okay. Okay. So he's not uh, pleading on behalf of the people, and he's not necessarily speaking on their behalf. Um, and I like what you added that, in fact, in some ways, he's the one receiving the blessings from 
from God. Um, is he representing the people? Okay, his filthy clothes are not just because he's dirty or he's sinful, um, but yeah, that's to sig signify the sins of the people. And then the clean clothes that are put on him is not just so that he individually can be forgiven, but rather as a representative of the people, um, he is robed in these clean white clothes. So I would agree that yes, he is serving as a representative uh, here uh, even in Zechariah chapter 3. You could fast forward a little bit to um, verse 9, the very end of it, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. We'll talk about that passage coming up. But this is talking about the, the sins of the land. So sins are being typified and forgiveness is being um, symbolized here, um, not just individually for Joshua, but rather for um, Joshua as a representative of the whole um, nation. Okay? So picture the scene. The Lord's chief representative stands before the angel of the Lord. The devil stands to his right to function as accuser, as he loves to do. The angel of the Lord flips the table and rebukes Satan. What is the reason given for the Lord's rebuke? Please. Okay. Satan is certainly responsible for, for the sins that they committed. Um, and obviously God has a vested interest in his people and wants to thwart the devil's plans and isn't going to just allow him to run roughshod over his people. That's certainly true. Um. Okay, yeah, this is the one that I've saved. You can see he's still kind of, his toes are still a little toasty, uh, but I've saved him from the fire, um, and therefore... Satan's uh, job here is done. I, I find it really interesting that this lined up perfectly with the sermon on the book of Job because this is a very, very similar um, occurrence to what happens in Job chapter 1 that uh, the devil has this uh, dialogue with God and God allows Satan to do some things but only what is in accordance with God's will. And I think Pastor Strong did a really good job of pointing that out, that God sometimes allows a longer leash for the devil, but nothing happens outside of his control. Um, so God is not out of control here as, the, as Satan comes to make his accusation against Joshua. And in fact, um, he gives him his moment and then shuts him up, right? Now you're done, and here's why. Um, if you go back a little bit earlier in that verse, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So the Lord is the one who chose Jerusalem. So here again is another defense for Joshua as representative minister here rather than individual. The reason that the devil has to keep his hands um, off of Joshua is because the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Because he is one of many that the Lord has chosen for return to the promised land and even for something greater. Okay. I think it's worth noting here. Um, let's see. Let's just review the angel of the Lord, the identity of the angel of the Lord. We talked about this last time, but just for the sake of review, who is the angel of the Lord? Okay, pre-incarnate Christ, second person of the Trinity, 
um, Jesus in action before he was born of the Virgin Mary. Um, that's what we have here. And I mentioned last time that often, even within the context of uh, uh, an account that involves the angel of the Lord, that there would still be um, evidence that the angel of the Lord has divine characteristics, qualities, and is therefore him himself um, divine in nature. Is there any proof in this section that would help defend the case that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ? Or at least is a member of the Trinity? Okay. He says, I have taken away your sins. Who's the only one that can take away sins? Yeah, if God is the only one who can remove sins, forgive sins, right? So when he switches to first singular, I have done this for sure. Caddy, did she steal your answer? Okay. Okay, yeah, I will put the turban on you, Joshua, he says. Um, I will be the one. L little further on in verse um, 7. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing there, um, or standing here. If you do these things, if you keep my law, if you remain faithful to me, I'll make you among the angels who can do my bidding and serve me here on earth forever in heaven. Um, that, this is all divine, right? This is, this is the angel of the Lord. This is the, the pre-incarnate Christ speaking, um, speaking of himself as God and appropriately so. Okay. The angel of the Lord calls Joshua a burning stick snatched from the fire. What does this mean? We talked a little bit about this um, previously that here his toes are a little toasty because he was removed from God's judgment in the Babylonian captivity. Um, get away from him, Satan, because look, I've chosen him, I've put him back, not just like the rest of the people in Jerusalem, but I've actually put him in a position of authority, made him the high priest. He's the representative of my people on earth. But I think there's a deeper meaning to this as well, and, and it, it's where we can start to apply this to ourselves too. How are we uh, burning sticks snatched from the fire? Um, we deserve to have the fire of hell uh, burn more than just our toes, uh, but yet, by God's grace, he has snatched us from the fires of hell. He has snatched us from eternity uh, because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, because of his blood shed in our place. Um, and therefore, God can say, I've chosen Jerusalem, I've chosen you, individual Christian, to put faith in your heart, to save you from the fires of hell, um, and to give you a place in, in heaven everlasting. Um, so, Satan, go away. This is my child who I have saved from the place that I prepared for you. This one is saved from the, from the fires um, that only exist because of, of your sin and your evil influence in the world. Um, this one I have chosen, this one I have saved. Uh, what a cool picture. A burning stick snatched from the fire. Questions, comments there? Okay. Joshua's filthy clothes are symbolic for sin and his clean clothes picture the grace of forgiveness. With those at your table, recount some of the places in Scripture where garments teach a lesson about sin or grace. I'm going to give you four minutes. Talk at your table. Places where Scripture uses a picture of garments to talk about or teach a lesson about sin or grace.
it got quiet. So that must mean we're done. So that must mean it's time to share. <laughs> All right, garments to teach sinner grace. Who'd like to start us out? Please. Okay, yeah, sackcloth and ashes. Uh, we even have Ash Wednesday as the tradition that um, signifies repentance. Um, yeah, so that I think is a connection between an, an outward posture and dress and, and uh, sin and I suppose sorrow over sin, repentance from sin. Okay, any others? Okay. Excellent. The, the parable of the wedding banquet where um, the one tries to come in on their own terms and in their own clothes rather than what was provided and uh, gets kicked out of the wedding banquet because of that. They're having their own clothes versus the clothes that were provided uh, would be the sin that's involved there. And I suppose the flip side of that is also that the clothes that were provided uh, that's the grace of the, the uh, banquet master, right? That's the grace of God that makes us able and ready to enjoy the feast. Okay, very good. The white robes of those that came out of the great tribulation from the book of Revelation. Excellent. Okay, any others? Yeah, it says even there that his clothes shone uh, bright like the sun uh, at Jesus' transfiguration. Excellent. I thought of the passage, um, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Uh, without God in the picture, even the good things that we do, that's, um, that's the filthy rags that we wear. Um, the word filthy uh, is brought up here for... Um, for uh, Joshua's clothing as well. So drew that connection. There was the Colossians passage that uh, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, um, which is an awesome, comforting passage of baptismal grace for us that thanks to the, the blessings of the sacrament of holy baptism, we now can be clothed in Christ. We now have the, those righteous robes that Jesus has prepared for us to wear. And we could probably spend most of the afternoon talking about uh, clothing pictures in the Bible, but that's a good snapshot um, and, and a, a good taste of, of some of the examples. Okay. Can you think of another time that normal clothes weren't good enough for the high priest? Maybe you know this detail from the Old Testament. Maybe you don't. On the great day of atonement, um, the high priest would have to take off his clothes and put on the prescribed clothes and not just uh, throw an Elbon over a suit coat like a pastor does today, but right down to the undergarments. Um, these were the things that God told the high priest, here's what you're going to wear uh, if you're going to serve my people. And it's not going to be the rags that you came to work in today. It's going to be these fine clothes that, that I provide for you. Um, so there again, symbolic um, of of sin and grace, symbolic of, uh, of the, the important task that God had carried out through the high priest. Um, okay. What did it say on the high priest's turban? Here's a picture of the turban is the, the headdress that he wears. You'd have to have really good eyesight to see it up there, I bet. Uh, we got a, here's another one. Make a plate of pure gold and engrave it as on a seal 
holy to the Lord. So there across the top, it says, Kadosh Ladonai, holy to the Lord. What does it mean if something or someone is holy? Caddy. Excellent. The word holy means to set apart from the Lord. I, I read it to you before, kadosh. Um, there are some people that think this can't be proven, but the word kad in uh, like the first half of kadosh is a word that means to cut. And, and so perhaps there's a connection there that um, something is cut and then separated and set apart. Um, Regardless of whether that's where the picture comes from, the, the word kadosh, the word holy, means to set apart as special. And so when God says, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy, he's saying you shouldn't have any sins, live a perfect life, uh, but the essence of holiness is that we are set aside, set apart from um, a sinful world, set apart from our old way of life, and now set apart as special for a special task. So maybe your mind jumps when you hear the word holy, jumps right to perfection, no sin, opposite of, of, uh, of what we are. Uh, but really it's, it's the be set apart as special. And that's why maybe you've run into um, the word holy in the Bible and have tried to squeeze, tried to shoehorn the concept of perfection into, um, like how does that fit? How does it work that um, God's name uh, is holy. Well, his name doesn't have any sin, okay, but his name isn't a, isn't a, it's a idea. It's so, or how can Mount Zion be God's holy mountain? It's a mountain. <laughs> Aren't all the mountains not sinful? <laughs> but what it means is that Mount Zion is set apart as special. Um, and so you've got, even in the temple tabernacle, you've got the holy place, the place that's set apart as special, and then the most holy place, the place that is even more set apart. Um, in Hebrew, when you want a superlative, so big, bigger is comparative, biggest is superlative, that's like the extreme. In Hebrew, what you do is um, you say king of kings, that's the top king, the kingliest of kings. Lord of lords is the superlative, he's the lordliest. Uh, that's not a word. He's the, he's the best of even all the masters, all the lords. So in the tabernacle, you have the holy of holies, or the most holy place. That means that is the place that is the most set apart as special. This is the place that is the most um, unique and the most um, holy of places, the, the most set separate and we talked about that with the great day of atonement. Only one guy, the high priest, could go in and only on one day of the year and only after he's sacrificed for his own sins and only when he's wearing the right things and only when he's got the, uh, the bowl full of the goat's blood. Only, only, only. That's how special that place is. The word holy shows up in the Bible 625 times. Um, and I just have a smattering of unique things that are holy. Genesis 2, verse 3, the seventh day is holy. God sets apart that seventh day as holy, and therefore the Sabbath day ends up becoming, remember the Sabbath day, by keeping it holy. That doesn't mean keep it free from sin. It means keep it set apart, keep it special. Um, okay? I found an interesting one in Leviticus chapter 19. Um, it's the fruit of the trees um, God says for three years you are not allowed to eat any of the fruit from the trees. It's detestable to the Lord. In the fourth year, all of the fruit from the trees, Leviticus 19 says, is holy. And what that means is it's set apart to God. This is now the offering. Take the fruit off the trees, give it to God. Year five, now you can have it. Now it's yours to enjoy the, the blessings of. But, and just the way that it describes that fourth year as this is holy. Not because of sin or not sin, but because it's set apart. The fruits are set apart to the Lord. God asks them to go through this task in order to um, keep their spiritual perspective and priorities straight. In uh, Numbers chapter 6, 
we're told that a person who takes a Nazarite vow is holy. Not because they haven't sinned, but they're holy because now by saying I'm not going to have any alcohol and I'm not going to come in contact with death and I'm not going to shave my head or cut my hair, they're now set apart for this special purpose. And they're holy in that way. They're going through these motions not because they take away sin, but they do set those people apart as special. So this concept of holy to the Lord, um, the high priest is one who is set apart for a special task. We'll get, we'll get to another symbol, another action that takes place to show that a high priest was set apart as special. That comes in the next chapter. Okay. Moving along. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates are men symbolic of things to come. What does that mean? The associates of Joshua would be the priests, or maybe by extension you could even extend it further to the people of Judah, the returnees from captivity. You and your associates are men symbolic of things to come. Okay, this forgiveness picture of taking off the filth and putting on the pure white robes um, is something that has an impact for everyone. Symbolic act that, um, yeah, that's a good one. I think this would be a good time to point out that even the name Joshua is Hebrew, the Hebrew that becomes Jesus. Uh, that's the same Hebrew word, the same root. Um, it means he saves. So even in the the name of this particular high priest, there's a symbol of the one that would come. I showed you the passage from Zechariah chapter 6 where the crown gets put on his head. Um, so you've got here in Joshua a uh, convergence of the priestly office and the kingly office. And this is a symbolic thing of the one who would bear his name to come, the one who would be the high priest, but would actually make a real sacrifice, the one not um, having... He, he really does it in reverse, right? That prophet, priest, king takes off the white robe and puts on the filthy garment of our sin to carry it to the cross. Um, symbolic of things to come. The reason that Zechariah is seeing this, the reason that this is happening um, to Joshua is more than just for him and his personal relationship with God. Uh, but rather, this is a symbol of God's personal relationship with his people. And the next line helps us to see another way that this becomes symbolic. The angel says, um, I am going to bring my servant the branch. <coughs> Excuse me. So Isaiah 1, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. Isaiah 11, verse 1, um, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch with a capital B will bear fruit. The branch there, the Messiah. Um, that comes and springs forth life. Here's Jeremiah 23. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Um, here another prophecy of the Messiah to come. So um, the angel of the Lord says, what's happening here is symbolic. And then right after it says that I'm sending a servant, I'm sending um, the Messiah to come in the same vein as, as Joshua himself. Questions, comments there? All right. A stone with seven eyes. See the stone I have set before Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone. When I was making this PowerPoint, I put the, uh, the word what with a question mark as a placeholder for when I was actually going to write the question. And then I liked it. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is happening with a stone with seven eyes? Um, I'm certain I'm going to see that picture in my dreams tonight. Um, <laughs> what is it about misplaced eyes that, that's creepy? I don't understand. But what's going on with the stone with seven eyes? 
This might seem peculiar. Seven eyes is actually something that comes up in the next chapter as well. I'll point that out when we get there. But this concept of being able to see, um, of course, an eye is uh, the organ that helps us see, that enables us, I should say, to see. Um, the number seven would have the connotation of completeness and fullness. So um, the number of mankind is four, the number of God is three. When you put four and three together, you get seven. It's God's interaction with mankind, God's full and complete interaction with mankind. So now you have seven eyes. An eye is um, this picture that God sees what's happening, and now there's seven of them. God sees what's happening with mankind, and he sees it fully. There's nothing that gets past him. There's nothing that he doesn't know and doesn't see. Um, this is a picture of God's omniscience. Um, and then tie that together with the fact that he is all-powerful and able to carry out his plan and will for us. Um, and you've got a comfort, comforting, albeit a little creepy, uh, picture of who our God is and what he, uh, what he can do for us. So here's the Zechariah 4. We'll read this through in just a couple of minutes. But the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. So God sees it. God sees the things that happen. God sees his people and their needs. God sees Joshua and he sees, because Joshua's a representative of everyone, he sees everyone and their needs and he's able to forgive them their sins by taking off their filthy clothes and putting on a clean garment. Okay? Here's another creepy thing with seven eyes. Uh, this is a picture of the lamb from the book of Revelation. I've got the quote or the reference backwards. It's actually Revelation 5 verse 6. I apologize for that. Um, the lamb in that picture looks like one who was slain. Uh, he's sitting on the scroll and he has seven eyes and seven horns. So um, maybe you would have preferred I not show you a picture of this, but this is one artist depiction of, of what John sees there, the lamb with seven eyes. Same concept there. We looked at Zechariah having foreshadowing and some of his imagery um, being carried forth. Uh, here you have the lamb and the stone with seven eyes married into one picture um, for the purposes in the book of Revelation. No, wrong order. <laughs> we don't have time to read the Revelation passage anyways. It talks about the lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, trust me. All right, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. What is that day? Good Friday is a great guess. Single day, sins forgiven, that's a great place to start. That's what I would, would say this passage is referring to. I tried to throw you off by putting a great day of atonement picture on this slide, but you caught me and got it right anyway. Some people might say that, and I wouldn't have too big an argument with that, other than really theologically what happened on the great day of atonement. How many sins were forgiven on that day? Yeah. The, the symbol of, of a year's worth of sins, but really, it was a symbol that pointed forward, so I would say you could make a case that nothing really happened on the Great Day of Atonement, other than people being reminded, keep looking. <laughs> Another year comes by and keep looking, uh, it's coming. It, it was a faith-building exercise in, um, in God's love, mercy, and forgiveness, but really nothing happened. On Good Friday is when it all happened, that was the sacrifice that all those other sacrifices pointed forward to. The Great Day of Atonement, the, um, the daily sacrifices that were carried out at the temple, all pointed forward to the Lamb who would shed his blood, willingly shed his blood and give his life so that we could be forgiven. So when God says, I will forgive their sins on a single day, um, I'd say this is Good Friday. Okay? Oops, there's Good Friday. Okay, what is the day that's spoken of in verse 10? In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty.
maybe let's answer the fig tree thing first. What does it mean to sit under a vine and a fig tree? Kenny. Okay, there definitely are, uh, you can tell that these are things that, that exist in Old Testament and New Te Testament uh, culture, right? Because there, there's lots of imagery that uses them. Um, a fig, to sit under a fig tree would be to have two things, to have protection and to have produce, to have blessings that are coming. Um, so the vine and the fig tree, Someone in the last uh, class referenced Jonah. Jonah had this, this vine that grew and he was happy to have its shade and then it went away and he got all upset because where, I deserve the shade and where did it go? Um, th so this is a, a for Micah 4 verse 4 uses a very similar concept, uh, a, a, a phrase to talk about peace and prosperity and protection, the vine and the, and the fig tree. When a believer looks at that and says, this is what we're looking for, there could be the connections to, um, we don't have any of those things in reality unless we have a connection to Jesus. And so the vine and the branches uh, picture comes in as well. And then this is a unique place because it adds the, you can invite your neighbor, which really just puts peace and prosperity and protection on a magnified scale. That you'll have it in that day, you'll have it so much that you can share. <laughs> that you can invite others to come and sit down next to you. You'll have so many figs that uh, you can hand them out um, and don't have to worry about having enough for yourself. So this is exorbitant blessings or, or prosperous blessings, I suppose you could say. So which day is this? This is the day that results immediately following the other day from verse 9. Because of my sins being forgiven on that one single day, now I live in this day, in this era of peace and protection and prosperity. Now I have uh, the, the promise of everlasting life because of what happened on that single day. Okay. Any comments or questions there? All right. Lamp stand and olive trees. There's a rogue S on this slide. My apologies. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, and someone awakened from, for, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, What do you see? I answered, I see a gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. All right. 
Vision number five. The sneeze came like five seconds too soon. God bless it. Would have been perfect. <laughs> but God bless you. All right. What is the golden lampstand? Where does it first appear? What is the significance of the lampstand? Have you ever seen a picture like that? There's a connection here because of this lampstand's use in the tabernacle and in the temple. If you look closely, can you see that on here? Yeah, you can see um, some of the blossoms, the almond uh, blossoms that are built into this lampstand that God prescribed to be uh, constructed for the tabernacle and then uh, again in the temple. Um, draws a connection then to priestly service this would sit in the, in the temple, the tabernacle proper itself. Um, when there was a, just a side story here, when there was a um, dispute over who had rightful authority to minister in God's house, um, there were people from every tribe in Israel that put their staffs in the temple of the Lord, in, in the Lord's dwelling. Um, I believe it was overnight. And then they came the next morning and you had 11 regular walking sticks and you had Aaron's that had budded almond blossoms. Um, and that staff got put in the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, but it was almond blossoms because it showed um, this is the one who is to serve um, here in, in conjunction in the priestly office. So there's that connection, lampstand, Aaron's staff that buds um, is all kind of a cool connection. Um, the significance of the lampstand, well, first of all, it served a... Um, functional purpose. It was dark in the, in the holy place, in the temple, in the tabernacle. There were sheets of cloth that were placed over the top and you'd have to walk in and this was uh, before electricity was invented so there were no light switches in the tabernacle. But the lampstand, God prescribed that it was a job of the priest to keep those lamps with oil so that it would be constantly burning, constantly giving light then that becomes a picture of God constantly giving light to his people, constantly um, giving light to the world through the gospel. Jesus calls himself the light of the world, and certainly an Old Testament style believer would have thought of this continually burning lamp in the temple. Okay. The two olive trees represent the royal line from Judah and the priestly line from Aaron, and thus the branches beside the pipes that pour out the oil are then the current rulers in each position. Zerubbabel was the governor or the ruler, and Joshua was the high priest. So you've got this picture here. The trees themselves, I suppose you could say, are Judah and Aaron, and then the branches that come out would be those specific um, people who serve in that specific function. This was one of the better pictures I could find. Um, sometimes these pictures get a little odd, what we're looking at, but I thought this was pretty good. The lampstand, the seven lamps, the bowl at the top, the pipe coming out of the olive trees um, into the bowl. I thought this was pretty good. Okay. Um, what's the connection between those two men and those two functions and olive trees? Here's a clue. This might be a fact that you're unaware of, and then this is a really hard question for you. But there's a clue in verse 14. Jeff. Okay. Yep. Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil, with olive oil, pour it over their heads to signify that these are ones who are set apart as special, set apart for a special task. Here is Samuel anointing King David, uh, the shepherd boy, um, to be the future king of Israel. So that was a way that God's people could see this is the one. Um, sometimes Jesus' baptism is called his anointing because God the Father pours out, or water is poured onto him um, and also, God the Father points his finger and says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is the chosen one. Um, so this anointing that happens with olive oil 
was a symbol of plenty, a symbol of a, a, a wish, an action that was a, an expression of a desire that prosperity continue in this person's reign. So whether you were serving as the king or, or as the priest, uh, the, this olive oil in abundance, so much so that it could, you could bathe in it, that it would r run over your head. That was the picture that was going on there uh, with anointing. So here, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Um, that's, the, that's what you see in that picture of the olive trees pouring oil into the bowl near the lampstand. Okay, last question. Who dares despise the day of small things? What is the small thing that is spoken of here? What are some biblical, <clears throat> what are some biblical examples of things that seemed small that served God's purposes? Are there any examples from your life? What's the small thing in this context? It's talking about Zerubbabel laying stones of the temple, right? Whether we're talking about, it uses the word capstone, which is usually like the last stone. If there's an arch, the capstone is the top and everything leans on it, and now it's done. Uh, this might be referring to the first stone being laid or the foundation that Zerubbabel laid. Um, a small thing, uh, there was no um, pause in world history to connotate the, or to, to mark out it wasn't breaking news at the time that a, a stone had been laid in its place. But God used that small thing to serve his purposes as the temple is built around it, as uh, God's people are served within it. Um, God used that small thing to accomplish big things. Can you think of, does that make your mind go to any other place in scripture where a seemingly small thing becomes something pretty great in God's eyes? There's a decent number of answers to this because this is kind of the way that God operates. Please. Okay, the widow's mite was a offering worth a penny or maybe even less, but Jesus stops everything and points his disciples and says there's great faith. Um, a, a small thing, uh, but God did pretty awesome things through it, right? We all grow from from that example in that lesson. Okay. Yeah, he was the, the baby boy, the runt. Um, can you imagine all the strapping, strong army uh, older brothers that are watching little teenage, maybe preteen David uh, get anointed as the one that God's gonna use and then look at what God did through David, right? You can apply this in, in any number of ways. Moses says, I don't, I'm not uh, eloquent. Why did you choose me to be a, a mouthpiece? Um, but God did some pretty awesome things through him. Um, Paul talks about his thorn, says it's not with wise or eloquent words that I'm here, uh, but I'm just preaching Christ crucified. Um, in, in a lot of ways, even Jesus is the, the small thing, or at least he comes in humility, right? Um, he doesn't come as a divine parade um, with all the angel forces from on high, but rather he's born in a barn in little Bethlehem. Um, God uses weak things or seemingly weak things to carry out his strong plans and, and purposes. Ways that he does that in our lives... Yeah, because God's the one who's really in charge. Um, if we put our trust, our mustard seed size trust in, in God, God can work some pretty awesome things through us. Think of normal, common people like we all are that God uses. Uh, I think we all would consider ourselves to be small. Um, no one's writing books about us or, or uh, world press isn't following our stories, but... God has uniquely gifted us and, and positioned us with 
a circle of influence that we, and then put a powerful message on our hearts and, and on our tongues. And, and what an awesome thing that God can do through us, through simple, normal people like us. I think of, uh, I love this story, Andrew, the disciple. He did, what, what do you know about Andrew? Not very much. Um, even on the pages of scripture, he's pretty low as far as a list of, of prominent disciples. The one thing that he did was something that you would probably consider to come pretty naturally to you. He told his brother about Jesus, his brother's Peter. Um, did God do pretty awesome and amazing things through Andrew? Of course he did. <laughs> because if you consider Peter an important uh, part of, of the, the story of God's people, then there's no Peter without an Andrew. <laughs> pretty incredible, right? Um, the stories that could be told of parents just doing what comes natural, just telling my kids about Jesus, just doing devotions with them at home, just sharing Jesus um, and, and what God can do. And it's my prayer that God surpass what he's done with me through, um, through my children. Um, God, God can and does that all the time. So don't be tempted into thinking that you're too small because um, through small things, through small people, God can do mighty and miraculous things. Any comments or questions on either of these visions from Zechariah chapter 3 or 4? All right, let's do our closing hymn. We'll sing three stanzas of The Lamb. The Lamb, the Lamb. Oh, Father, where's the sacrifice? Faith sees, believes. God will provide the lamb a prize. Worthy is the lamb whose death makes me his own. The lamb is reigning on his throne. The lamb, the lamb, one perfect final offering. The Lamb, the Lamb, let earth join heaven his praise to sing. Worthy is the Lamb, whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. The Lamb, the Lamb, as wayward sheep their shepherd kill, so still his will on our behalf the law to fill. Worthy is the Lamb whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. All right, thanks for being here today. Part three, we'll finish up the visions of Zechariah next time. Zechariah chapter five and six. God be with you till we meet again.